Connected Claims Webinar. My name is Alan Demers and I'm your moderator. And today we're talking about competitive insurance claims. Our topic is making claims your competitive advantage in today's insurance market. My background is over 30 years in insurance and claims and coming from the carrier space, I now consult with startups and different vendors, um, all seeking to modernize and innovate in the insurance space from all different angles. When it comes to customers, claims stands on the front lines of insurance as the key differentiator for customer retention. That's especially true as customers seek that moment of truth uh, that's a cut above the rest. And making claims that focal point of innovation uh, is certainly something that we're seeing a lot of. So to unlock better customer retention and greater efficiency, carriers need to transfer, transform claims into their key competitive advantage quickly or face falling behind. Uh, it truly is a foot race out there. Reuters Events is proud to be bringing together claims leaders to showcase how and why claims represents every carrier's true competitive advantage. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have a terrific panel. And starting first with Angela Delude, she's head of claims at Mass Mutual. Uh, Hillary Jarvis, she's managing director of claims and compliance and strategy at Marco. And Peter Upapong is principal business value and strategy at Anaplan. So as we talk about this uh, today, about making claims a true competitive advantage, keep in mind, disrupting expectations, moving beyond customer expectations with reimagined process, renewed focus on changing customer expectations, addressing need rather than being changed by the customer, and then also risk management, responding to changing nature of risk with maximum agility is no longer negotiable. And that's regardless of the size of your organization. So with that, let's start first by hearing from Angela, if you'd introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your side of things. And then we're gonna go right down the list uh, next to Peter, then Hillary. Welcome, sure. Angela. Thanks, Alan, I'm happy to be here. So I'm Angela DeLude. I work for Mass Mutual Financial Group. I head up a claim strategy team over there. Uh, representing uh, four primary lines of business, the life, uh, life disability, annuity products, as well as long-term care products. So I'm gonna talk today a little bit about the way that I, I, I really see us heading um, in terms of an industry and some of the, the key things that we're focused in on at Mass Mutual. Um, when we think about, you know, as Alan was stating, you know, what it really takes to have claims and claim servicing really be you know, a value proposition out in the marketplace and really a differentiator when we think about, you know, kind of an aggregate from new business to, to time of claim. Um, so when I think about, you know, this, it's, it's really just, it's four key elements and they really kind of build off of each other. So I'd say the first and foremost is, and Alan touched on this lately, is, is really our digital transformation. Um, you know, for us, that's that's been a key element for the last couple of years and continues to be kind of a steady focus for us, really just laser focused on, you know, additional capabilities, thinking about things like omni-channel experience, um, you know, really just, you know, building out, you know, further building out and enhancing, you know, capabilities and what that needs to look like in the marketplace. I think it starts with, you know, understanding and continuing to understand our customer personas, our advisor personas, doing a lot of journey mapping along the way, obviously, as you build out capabilities you know, some of the things you need to do is make sure that, you know, you, we go after these things, you know, um, hopefully with well-informed decisions and prioritization and really what our, our customers, our policyholders, our annuitants, our advisors, right? A lot of different types of customers out there. What are they looking for, right? And as we build out um, this experience, we've got to make sure that we are, you know, we're heading in the right direction. So it's kind of like checking and adjusting along the way. Um, so that's, you know, something that I think is, is, is really cool that we're doing right now. Just, you know, I've seen a lot of companies, I think, just go off in one direction, you know, and not look back. Um, and I think that there's some dangers in that. Um, so in addition to, you know, when I think about digital experience, that really just cascades right into service experience. Um, and that is something that we feel like is our, 
our, probably our biggest value proposition, right? It's why we're here, right? To deliver on the promise when it matters the most, right? So whether that's a disability claim, a life insurance claim, an annuity product, right? Like we don't often get compared to, to like industries, right? We don't even get compared to property and casualty. We just get compared to service experience, right? And that means something I think different for everybody, but for us, we really try to make every claim a personalized and exceptional experience. Every claim, you know, has commonality, but every claim is unique in its own way. So um, really thinking about from a service experience perspective, what does that mean? Um, thinking about things like empathy, right? And meeting the customer kind of where they are. You know, sometimes it's more of a business transaction, um, but a lot of times it's a very intimate, you know, type of situation, whether it's a, you know, a grieving widow or, you know, somebody coming on disability claim after, you know, some type of, you know, unforeseen circumstance happens in their life. And, you know, from a, from a servicing, you know, experience perspective, then we think about the associate experience, right? And we think about, you know, we really are in a war for talent, right? I think COVID has done nothing but exacerbate that, you know, it's really changed the market in terms of how we recruit, how we hire, um, I think it's opened up a lot of doors for people in terms of being able to be more remote, more virtual. You see more and more companies, right, heading in the at least hybrid model direction, if not 100% virtual, right, like making big and bold moves by selling, you know, selling off brick and mortar completely. Um, so I think there's a lot that has to be considered there in terms of um, the direction that we head in, you know, um, and I'm, I'm talking development and succession planning kind of end to end. Um, so when I think about, you know, things like, you know, whether it's tuition reimbursement or what are we doing in terms of having a framework within the claims department in terms of progression, um, I think that there's a lot, you know, a lot to be considered there. And obviously, you know, they are, they're our talent base. They're, they're what ha makes the magic happen every day, right? So when we think about the customer service, you know, experience, you know, really looking at it from an associate lens. And that's where I kind of say it almost makes a full circle back to digital transformation, because, you know, we are an older company, right, with a, a lot of different types of products and services. And technology at times can get in our way, right? It can frustrate our associates, um, it's it it tends to be something that we spend a lot of time. Um, we'd rather be focusing on teaching the critical thinking part of the jobs or, or or concentrating on products and complexities and the risk management side of things. But often we we build in hours, if not days, into training and onboarding that really is just surrounded by the administrative aspects of the job. Um, and that really what I think is cool about technology now is, we're building capabilities that are um, universal. So there are things that, you know, can be used from a customer portal perspective, but also have a back end, you know, kind of office element to it. So I think that's really smart in terms of kind of narrowing the technology footprint. Um, but I, and I also think that, you know, like I said, it, I think it's, it's about job satisfaction. Nobody, nobody drives into work or logs into work every day and says, I can't wait to have, uh, you know, slow, slow systems or, you know, keystroke complexities, right? Like, so I think that that's something that's really cool to think about in terms of, you know, how far technology can kind of take us there from a digital aspect. You know, to, to summarize, you know, kind of the four elements that I mentioned earlier on, you know, that really leads us to, okay, we do all this, right? We do this digital transformation. We hire the right folks. We get them, we get them tenured, right? And we start to really move the needle with service experience. We measure that through things like voice of customer, but really, how do we stay in it for the long haul, right, in terms of value proposition? And I think that the direction that, you know, the industry is heading in here is really looking at this asset retention aspect of claims that I think for a long, long time has been underserved, right? And I think that, you know, um, it's, it's a big aspect of what we're talking to our field force about these days, our advisors, when we think about even the way that they do business. Um, thinking about how broad brushed, you know, financial planning really can be for somebody and thinking about the beneficiaries, not at time of claim, but before the claim even happens, right? So really thinking about coming to the table and not just talking to a policyholder, you know, an owner of a contract, but also saying, hey, you know, it probably makes sense to have a conversation with your beneficiaries, especially if it's a family member 
or somebody that, you know, I, I will say often gets overlooked because it's just, you know, oh, they know where my paperwork is or they know what the, you know, they know what my final wishes are. But, um, you know, what we see on a daily basis, right, is that at time of claim, you're not, first of all, in the best frame of mind. A lot of times you think you're organized, but you're really not, you know? <laughs> um, so you start thinking about all of that, right? And I think that there's an opportunity to start doing more estate planning ahead of time. And how can technology and the service experience that we offer, whether it's, you know, paper materials, online materials, but also how does the advisor, you know, help us, you know, kind of, you know, before, right, claim even happens. Um, again, depending on if you're a direct to consumer model or you're, you know, kind of an advisor served model, I think there's opportunities on both sides of that. Um, and I, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, retention is everything, right? In terms of repeatable business and, and growing a book of business. And I, I think that there's a huge opportunity there. Thank you, Angela. I really appreciate your perspective. I think you said a lot there that really um, resonates. One, you know, just uh, echoing the idea of a digital claims transformation. It's not a one-time event. It's not just install it. So I think you said that you know, the look back is really important. Um, and that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And, and it won't be a one-time event where you just install a new technology and expect that all future needs are met by that because they're constantly evolve, all evolving and changing. And as you said, they're, you're compared to other digital experiences out in the marketplace that may not even be insurance. And then that last part uh, is really fascinating. It reminds us that not all claim types are created equal, but certainly the idea of engaging with customers uh, before they have a bad day, um, <laughs> that really is where the value add can be. So I appreciate your comments. Um, Peter, let's, let's move over to you and uh, give us your background and uh, talk to us about your point of view. Sure. Thanks, Alan, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Peter Upapong. I'm with Anaplan, uh, a principal of the uh, part of the business value and strategy team. My background, I'd probably say, focuses really on scenario and strategic planning, as well as enterprise transformation, being a leader in this space, um, and then moving into consulting at Accenture and the Hackett Group leading practices, and being fortunate to be a confident, uh, an advisor, uh, shouting board, or or maybe I meant to say sounding board, uh, to many of folks probably attending this this session. So I, I really appreciate those joining. I think when I was thinking about comments for this, uh, you know, for this webinar, is really, you know, I was reading this book this weekend called The Art of the Long View um, by Peter Schwartz, and there's this one quote by um, Paul Valeri, which is which says, "We have so much knowledge with so much uncertainty." And so this was said back in, I think, 1920s, 1930s timeframe about interesting times. But I think it echoes and reflects so much of what's going on today. Whether you call it unprecedented or black swan events, we're seeing these things happen more and more often. And from a claims perspective, what this means is large claim events, channel overloads, this type of thing. And so we're seeing organizations need to, to really uh, think about how to become more resilient and how do they respond. And when I was thinking about breaking this into two parts, it's really how do we improve in terms of the predictability and likelihood in terms of how we think about the claims? And, you know, we have elements that I think Angela talked to, which is the customer facing tools, the automation, maybe layering AI, ML, all these things, and ultimately the evolution and, uh, and refinement of the skills of tenured claims agents. But I think there's also an element in terms of part two to this, this answering and addressing resiliency, which really comes down to when we have these large claim events or, or thinking ahead of these things happening and they're occurring across our blocks of business, how can we ensure that we're ready to deal with this situation from a people perspective, a funding perspective, and ultimately how do we, we take a stance where we can you know, pay out in a timely fashion, ensure a positive customer experience you know, for our customers during their most vulnerable times. And so I think a lot of what we do and the work that I've done with a lot of claims leaders is, is, is focused on kind of the risk management side. And so how do we effectively and efficiently think about risk management from a, you know, when we're forecasting in terms of what we're signing up for today, the liabilities going forward, and ultimately the downstream impacts, impacts to the rest of our organization. And so working with leaders, you know, from my consulting days, as well as at Anaplan, I think the, you know, claim leaders are thinking a lot about whether you call it capacity, workflow, or prioritization. And so, 
you know, the challenge I think is often thinking about the real time understanding of the open claims, the effort in terms of gathering drivers and leading indicators that are presented to us on the front line, and then ultimately being able to make the decision making criteria and getting to the point of the decision, um, you know, thinking about these targets that we have to ensure a positive customer experience as well as regulatory requirements. And so, you know, how do you approach this? So you think about scenario planning, you think about claims analytics and shared assumptions. And the thing that I've seen working with claims leaders recently is we have a seat at the table now coming out of kind of the pandemic and all these things. And you are all now Spider-Man, right? You all have, you know, with great, uh, you know, um, you know, power comes great responsibility. And so I think table stakes in terms of expectations to the organization is creating that aligned view in terms of when a claim is open, when it's paid and when it's closed and being able to support your business partners as that trusted advisor to facilitate shared assumptions and scenario planning across the organization. You know, I, I've really, you know, in a prior life, I was leading strategic planning at one of the largest financial service insurance companies. And it was during the, you know, during the financial crisis. And from that experience and all those things that I've learned, it's always came back to scenario planning isn't about predictions. And for me, it's about having confidence. It's about being able to say that I'm prepared for what happens. And the confidence is really built on the insights in terms of all these different possible outcomes. And when we layer in this unpredictable context of all these things that are happening, I think freedom for us as claim leaders really comes down to our ability to both act confidently in the face of all this uncertainty. So I think the question that I always challenge claims leaders and other leaders in this space is, as we're going through kind of setting up this value proposition or creating this differentiating factor is, what are the questions you're asking yourself that often many are denying at the face of uncertainty? You know, we're leading these things, we have to put on a face to sure that things are in control, but what elements are are existing that are uncertain to us and thus ultimately creating the blind spots in our process. And I think the interesting thing that we're seeing is that, you know, the expectation around segmentation when you're trying to do this scenario analysis is going to a much more detailed level. And I think technology in the past has been quite limited in terms of our ability to address the segmentation that we really want to be able to do and the scenario planning that we want to do at all levels of the organization. You know, whether you're trying to break out mental health claims associated with dis disabilities, or if you're on the PNC side talking about tractor trailers, right? I think it's this segmentation, what I've seen firsthand in terms of capability for claims leaders, it's about providing a more accurate view that feeds into the view of profitability that will ultimately change the underlying drive in terms of how we think about our go-to-market. But specifically within claims, it starts having us think about and reevaluate re how we balance the number of touch points in our claims process, right? So that we can still ensure a fast close, avoid over and under payments, while still managing operational costs and resource utilization. You know, I think a lot of folks are get excited and jazzed about when you think about intelligent forecasting and AI and ML. And I think the table stakes place to start is identifying obviously those lower complexity situations, right? I think that's the natural place to start. Can we automate some of those things? And I think when we talk about insurance organizations, carriers, those kind of things, we're infamous in terms of requiring such an immense amount of knowledge right, and, and history to really enforce the information that we have for our block of business. But the real question is how do you use this data to be predictable? And I think one of the foundational ways is identifying maybe some of those complex areas and creating automated baselines and creating scenarios based off those things where they may not necessarily be the final forecast that you move forward with, but it's giving you more options. It's giving you more perspective in terms of possible outcomes. And so where we're seeing this in Anaplan, where folks are taking kind of maybe their investment that they've made in these AI ML algorithms that maybe have been reserved to the data scientists of your organization and bringing that into a human centric design strategic type of platform, really focused on then how do you align the perspective and assumptions and scenarios across the organization to both support near-term and long-term decision-making. I think the other element as you start moving past kind of the risk management component is saying, okay, well, we're assessing this risk, we're thinking about this, but how do we get, how are we prepared for these type of events? And I think when you talk about workforce planning, I think it's really thinking about how we manage the effectiveness and 
and productivity of our, our, our workforce to really improve cu the customer experience as well as the business outcomes. I mean, we start with this whole managing complexities and all these things around kind of moving beyond kind of just the customer experience. But the reality behind closed doors is us dealing with and trying to assess and understand volumes at many different levels. It's about how we gather all these different data points and sources. And then how do we address all these competitive technology innovators or the complexity that just naturally that maybe we actually love. That's why we love our, our role, which is, you know, you know, being able to navigate through all this complexity within our, within our business. And what we tend to see, especially when you think about planning of workforce, is there's a, so many varying levels of planning and need that's required, right? So it's maybe some, for some organizations that seem very difficult to aggregate at a global level. Uh, some have find it very difficult to run scenarios in terms of the internal scheduling or really assess and impact surges in terms of changing business needs. And then you start trying to get, you get some pressure from the disjointed kind of long-term resource plan that's being um, presented to you as a claims leader while you're still trying to manage also your tactical weekly and intraday real-time plan, right? So you can see there's all these elements of planning that are existing and the handoffs is where I think that's where this is the greatest opportunity to kind of bring synergy across these different pieces. And I don't think technology, you know, we, you know, I'm at a plan where a platform, right? Technology is not the magic bullet here, right? Technology is an enable of that process, right? And we're continuing to see the maturation of customers realizing, hey, there may be elements that are not ripe and ready to be able to facilitate to this onboard to this technology. But can we look to this technology to give us perspective of what others are doing within the industry that is actually leading practice? And whether you leverage this technology or not, can we at least capture those process and those things and bring those things so that the, we unburden our people with kind of the the uh, the manual effort, right? And, and if you if you're moving towards that thing, I think you're moving then towards really a connected workforce planning platform where you're really bringing together how I vision system of record, system of execution, maybe elements of data insights and and points of view to actually have a real time view, which gives you the agility and transparency that you're looking from a decision making standpoint. And so when you think about kind of the evolution of those steps, right, you start with headcount planning, maybe you move to strategic workforce planning, skills planning, all these different things, you layer on these capabilities. I, I, you know, I love the point around digital transformation. It's not a single point in time. If it is, then you've made a mistake, right? It's about building capabilities over time that naturally add to them. Um, so, you know, I think if I was going to leave any lasting points and kind of personal observations working with leaders in this space, what I'm actually seeing is the competitive advantage duration continues to shorten, which is kind of, I think, the harsh reality. And just because we've done something right in the past doesn't mean we're going to do it right again in the future. You know, we have so much knowledge, but there's so much uncertainty. So I think us as leaders, I think, is how can we best position our team to run the different scenarios and build that confidence, but also have the right workforce at the right place at the right time to, to ensure that optimal customer experience. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Peter. I, you know, I, again, you covered a lot of ground there too and said some things kind of stick here. One of them being the um, predictability of the forecasting. That may mean something different, whether it's, uh, yeah, I wrote down here, capacity, uh, forecasting workflow, or just even prioritizing and how that varies. Um, so <clears throat> really important to keep that in mind. And then I, I think you're right. Um, the, the other changing demand here isn't just the demand on technology, but how that may change on people as well. And so up until now, um, we could probably make up in our industry for maybe some clunky processes, uh, good people that did a lot of workarounds. I don't, we used to use that phrase quite often. It was the land of the workarounds <laughs> and, and people tend to get quite good at that. Uh, but as we rely more on systems and technology and automated and digital platforms for customers, um, some of those um, inefficiencies may be more exposed uh, unintentionally. So really appreciate your perspective. Before we go to Hillary, um, just want to remind our audience that you can ask questions in the Q&A section. We'll take those um, once we finish with Hillary's conversation. So that's a good 
segue right over to you, Hillary. Talk about you and thank you for waiting so patiently. Uh, give us your background and your point of view. Sure, I'm happy to do that, Alan. And I'm really, really excited about being Spider-Man, Peter. I did not know that that was gonna be something that would come up today. Um, I have jokes about the Markel claims universe and like the Marvel corollary in general, but I didn't know about the Spider-Man thing. So I'm taking that away for people. Uh, before I became Spider-Man, I spent about 20 years, mostly on the PNC side of the industry. The first half of my career, roughly speaking, was an outside advisor at law firms, litigation work, regulatory advice and wording. Most products on the PNC side I've touched at some point, um, which comes in handy because Mark Hill is a specialty carrier and I'll talk more about that in a minute. The second half of my career I've spent in house first as a regional GC for a large admitted carrier and then the past seven years almost at this point um, at Markel. Originally lawyering at Markel as well, managing part of our national litigation book, but now I run our compliance and strategy team. And I've spent the past three years building out really various shared services at Markel in our operations department. My team advises on a very wide variety of domains and we consider ourselves advisors. Um, those domains include compliance, because we put it in the title, uh, strategy, we put that one in the title too. We decided that business intelligence and analytics sort of fell within strategy, but that's part of my team as well. And so we really try to think of ourselves, as I mentioned, as advisors, helping claims end to end, create a better product, think about how we work, how we work together better, and the data that supports all of that and that we leverage to create a better claims department and a better claims process for people. We help our claims folks be more, I try to call it small A agile, and you can tell I say the small A part out loud because then people get very attached to the agile thing if you don't, um, and improve iter iteratively, apparently I can't say iterative today, um, but also ironically inject discipline in how we do things, perhaps that's ironic as well, instead of sort of flitting from thing to thing, thinking about what, how things fit together as part of the bigger picture of how we're going to claim at Markel. We consider that's a lot of what we do for Markel. So as I mentioned, Markel is a specialty insurer, and that means that we have lots and lots of kinds of PNC claims. Um, we have small personal lines claims because we do sell personal lines and admitted business, and we have very large um, excess kinds of claims as well in the commercial space. That means we have a lot of different supporting vendors and different supporting technologies that we need because unlike bigger admitted carriers, we don't have our own field organization. So we're heavily reliant on vendors and we have to make sure we get the mix of these things right for our customers and the various different products that we support. So that's the key really is, and we've talked a lot about people already, is making sure we have the right people and the right technologies for the different products that we support and making sure that that match is as good as it can be. So for example, our personal lines, workers comp or small commercial claims, we may have folks who need speed to get back to work or need speed to replace their property that's been damaged. Those may be customers where we wanna text with the customer, we have to do things quickly and we need to get them back to the place they wanna be. We may need a variety of payment options. Some customers, particularly in the personal line space, may not be traditional banking users. And so those are the sorts of things that we need to think about. We have complex claims, casualty, professional liability, these customers are often sophisticated companies. They want sophisticated solutions that really, when you boil it down, help them protect their brand. A lot of these claims are litigated and they wanna make sure that the brand is protected in litigation circumstances. In those circumstances, we often have our claims folks being tenured attorneys who handle claims in partnership with our outside customers, those insured, and making sure we have the right experts as well to partner in their defense. Our vendor panels have to have the right counsel, 
as I said, the right expert and not just proven success, but frankly, these days, also people who reflect positively on our customers' reputation. The e &I is an issue in the insurance industry that everyone, you know, broadly companies want to address. And so our vendors can reflect as well on our customers and how we're selecting those. And that's something that we keep an eye on too. So we need to, as I've said, make sure all of that mix is as optimal as we can make it because our underwriting partners obviously want to adapt in today's market as well. We have um, a segment of our business that writes insure tech products from the perspective of, that they're novel products, not necessarily from the perspective that they are insure tech solutions. And so we may be selling unusual products. We may be selling traditional products in unusual ways. We also have traditional, as I've mentioned, um, admitted business, but largely we are an ENS company. And so what we sell isn't necessarily off the shelf what everyone sells. And so we have to be prepared for those solutions and know our underwriting partners' appetites and their plans and work with our actuarial partners to be sure we're anticipating how claims can look for us in the future. Um, that means being ahead of the curve on hiring and selecting products that leverage our talented employees, and then maintaining and retaining those employees as well. And in cases where the model may change, being prepared to make sure that people have the skills they need for tomorrow. Um, Angela mentioned that, you know, people have more flexibility in the workplace these days. And so that's always been a competitive environment, although the insurance industry traditionally had very low turnover. Um, that's become a more competitive environment. We see, like, we leverage and we see our competitors leverage LinkedIn and other social media tools, both to, you know, work with their employees, but also to interest other folks' employees and perhaps becoming their employees someday. And that's something that we have to be vigilant at as well for ourselves and understanding what the marketplace looks like um, for our employees and folks who we might like to have become our employees. So there are um, a lot of different factors obviously at play and making sure that we have that right mix. The people part, in my opinion, comes first in having that right mix. And so we want to make sure that the people are right um, in our claims organization, but then leveraging that right mix of folks, you know, the folks who handle our personal line claims, the folks who handle our large complex claims, leveraging their time to the extent we can with the right technology to back that up, whether that may be process automation or texting or, you know, add-ins to our claim system, whatever that may be, so that we can really leverage the human capital that we've created by hiring and retaining the right people in the first place. Thank you, Hillary. I, you, again, another great perspective there to start out the conversation. Um, one thing that came immediate to mind was when you look at the technology against such a degree of complexities that you laid out there, everything from lines of business to some customers simply needing speed, others needing a different form of way of getting paid. Um, and then, you know, whether it's excess and surplus lines or, or anything else that you're doing, um, do you look for technologies that cross all the common denominators of those type of uh, different claims? Or do you think about it as finding out what is relevant to the various specialties within the organization or both? So I'm a lawyer and that means I'm required to say it depends at least once <laughs> during any presentation. And I have t-shirts that I'll hand out if anybody would like one of my It Depends t-shirts. Um, I'm kidding. But I do think it depends on the circumstances. Like there are some technologies that we want to leverage because any customer would like to be paid efficiently and accurately, right? And so that makes sense across a variety of claim types. Um, that you have an efficient and effective payment platform. That doesn't mean that the choices within that platform would be the same for your large commercial customer who might want a wire transfer versus you know, your small personal lines customer who might want a bank card or something of that nature because we have both of those sets of customers. 
But there are some technologies, you know, we text with our personal lines customer, that often doesn't make any sense in our litigated complex claims, right? There, it's just not a technology that comes up as something that people want. So it depends. Good. And I want one of those t-shirts, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start. I've with been joking about them for years and my team thinks I'm actually going to have them made. So I may need to actually get them made. No, it, it really does make sense. And then, you know, um, I, I suppose the answer is both, you know, you're looking at the kind of complexities that go across the organization, but in your example, all, all claims need to get, well, all qualifying claims need to get paid somehow. And I think maybe the same is true about reporting claims. They all have to get reported some way, but it doesn't mean they're all going to be the same coming and going in that context. Um, so Angela, let's start with you on this uh, first question we have from the audience. And how, how are changing workforces considered when assessing workforce planning? Oh, gosh, well, it depends right now. Um, so <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, right? Um, so I would say, you know, more complicated now probably than ever, right? Um, because really, you know, so first and foremost, right, you got to, you know, forecast, right, is a, a best estimate, right, of what the future holds, right? If there's never any guarantees and plus or minus 5%, you're doing all right, you know, in terms of accuracy. But um, I think, you know, we, we are starting, we talked earlier about the importance of data sophistication. The first thing I'll, I'll hit on there is that, you know, I think we are starting to realize, and I think, again, COVID has, you know, kind of given us a good, uh, you know, a good shake here in terms of wake up, right, in term, you know, really understanding the dynamics at, a, I guess, a deeper level from a forecasting perspective, both on the morbid, morbidity, you know, side of the house as well as mortality, right? So, you know, and then teasing apart what is, you know, during pandemic circumstance, you know, at one point throughout the year, as an example, our volume was up substantially um, in one of our lines of business and really understanding, you know, it, what is this, right? Is this COVID driven, you know, too early to tell? How far do we, you know, how much deeper do we look into it? You know, so I think, you know, it's, it's given us appreciation for how important, um, you know, that type of forecasting of your business is. Um, and then I think, you know, Typically, right, none of us have the luxury from a unit cost expense management perspective of staffing to peaks and valleys. We tend to, you know, staff as best as we can throughout the year. And then I think, you know, um, Peter, you mentioned earlier, you know, the importance of really understanding segmentation. I think you start, you start to get into, are you structured the right way? Um, before you can even start to think about staffing and what that looks like, right, you really have to sometimes I think take a step back and look at your organization structure and say, when's the last time we really gave this a hard look? You know, are we structured the right way based upon how our business has evolved, right? Are we in a peak or valley right now? Do we think it's repeatable? Um, so I think these are all things, right, that I, I can't imagine Mass Mutual is the, uh, the only one in this boat right now kind of assessing the lay of the land here um, and trying to make some more strategic decisions, I think for a longer term play and then again, of course, you know, you start to think about your talent pool. What does that look like? You mentioned earlier, one of you mentioned earlier, you know, um, we tend to, as a older insurance company at times, for the, for the folks that are most tenured, we pride ourselves on knowing all these manual workarounds and knowing the new nuance of our business. And I think it's, we're spending a lot of time from a change management perspective, really talking to our associates about a different value proposition in the future for them. You know, as we start to automate and digitize more, you know, that we, they are going to build their toolkit in new and different ways, right? And we need to embrace that. We need to teach them that that's a good thing. Um, and they, we need to most importantly, make sure they understand that we're here, we're thinking about it, they have a safety net, um, that we are gonna help arm them for a different future. Um, and I think, you know, again, back to that hybrid model, right? Like opening things up, opening recs up, especially in kind of, I'll call it niche roles, opening them up nationally or even worldwide changes the game, right? Like um, I think, you know, we, we've seen in the industry, I'll use underwriting, you know, back in my new business days as a, that was probably the first from an operation standpoint where we really just, there's a lot of celestialness of that business. People move around companies. And I think when you started to see companies offering to work hundred percent remote, 
like people were, were jumping ship all over the place, right? And so you think about how our pandemic situation has now changed that. And in some ways, the good news is none of us are alone in on that, right? So it's kind of just like become a, a competition amongst ourselves in some ways. Um, but again, I think a big, the big linchpin here is the organizational structure and understanding the evolution of your business. And before we start saying, are we adequately staffed or how do we need to change staff? I think we need to make sure we're structured the right way. Well said. Um, Peter, this question came in for you. What is the maturity of the market for solutions to support transformation when it comes to planning and forecasting? Should it be a buy or build approach? So I think, yeah, so I think if you would have asked me this question in 2019, when I was deep in like a number of like consulting engagements and transformations, I would have said the maturity in this space uh, for that type of support and transformation was still quite early. Uh, but I think I've been kind of, maybe it's personally revitalized by and, and encouraged by seeing a number of leaders that I've spoken to as of recent, really embracing it. And maybe it's by necessity or, or just understanding, you know, if we have a dollar to invest, are we just, you know, are we at, are correctly investing that dollar in the right component of our business? Have we addressed the table stake things? Have we really invested in something that will help us and improve the understanding of the cost to serve in terms of, of a claim, as well as effectively manage, you know, our operational investment and the ROI of any type of investment? Now, when I talk about build versus buy, I think also from my own perspective, and I'd love to hear if, if anyone has seen this too. I think it's traditionally been a build perspective um, to try to make sure that we in the insurance industry keep you know, our assets and, and, and things that we've created homegrown based on the specific complexities of our organization. I think historically also the decision between build versus buy within this space is, has been due to a lack of customization and flexibility of legacy uh, uh, softwares and, and, and tools. And so when we talk about Anaplan as a platform and when I've encountered kind of this build versus buy discussion, I think it always boils down to total cost of ownership. I think it's the ability to change and it's the connectivity across the enterprise really. You know, you create something in a silo here for this, it may serve the purpose for this point in time requirement for our function within claims. But are we really thinking to that point of, you know, what Angela is saying, hey, what if we need to pivot our business? How quickly could we pivot based on something that we built based on, you know, maybe some core SQL or CSS versus utilizing kind of the modern platforms and a plan included in this set of tool sets where it's really, you know, you're building on and a plan or you're building on XYZ software. And those are the type of uh, softwares I think that have garnered more attention from leaders in this space. It's, it's being able to now then leverage those internal process owners to maintain their own model, maintain their own process versus in the past being so heavily reliant on those IT resources to be able to do things. And so, you know, I think, you know, when you think about the cost to serve, I think all the, you know, or when you think about kind of the total cost of ownership, a lot of times you're initially just thinking of how much will it initially cost me. But I think about kind of the change scenarios. How quickly do we need to change our hierarchies? How quickly would we want to, if we were going to change our data models? And what would be that cost to make that change? And I think typically nine times out of 10, you'll find whether it's Anaplan or other these platform, true platforms that you can build upon, the co total cost of ownership is significantly less than what you would anticipate from kind of just a core build. Hillary, this one came in. I would add to that. Oh, please do. Oh, I'm, I'm, I pay, I'm off script, Alan. I'm adding to Peter's point. I, I think our customers <laughs> at this point don't have a lot of appetite for trying to stitch things together and trying to understand like why I got this number from over here and that number from over there and how they truly align on things so that they can run the business and claims folks, at least on the PNC side, I don't know whether this is on the life and health side, have spent time trying to get their claim systems modernized and the right integrations with that. But having 
platforms that truly allow people to, particularly those outside of claims, to understand claims and how we claim, which I clearly use as a verb all the time, um, and what that means for the business overall, there's very little appetite to be like connecting the dotted lines or getting reports from different places that don't quite line up and that kind of thing. Yeah, sorry, I'm just gonna add one more thing to this and then I swear we'll let you get to another question, Alan. So, you know, I think, you know, <laughs> I think it depends on, the, on what your company's doing, I think strategically, right? So if you're in a unit and you're representing claims, right? And you're a bigger company, right? Like, and they're doing something that's majorly digital, you know, digital and they're building in house, then I think you, you know, I, I've seen it. I mean, I've been at Mass Mutual for 20 years and I've seen this come full circle on this, maybe, maybe more than once. Um, and I think, you know, some of that probably is just technology and evolution. And I think at one point we were a much more vendor reliant. Um, and I think, you know, things that have progressed, right? Like API services, right? And just the ability to tap into these legacy systems versus sinking, you know, millions of dollars, right? Into trying to convert old legacy systems into a newer platform, right? Like, so, so much of the, the technology has evolved. I would say from my seat, like I've seen it done both ways, right? Currently living in one way in particular. And I'd say both of them have the pros and cons. I think you really, there's like a new, it feels like there's a new, new startup of an insurance tech company, like every five minutes, right? Like, um, and, you know, I know there's a lot of you on the call, so hopefully you don't take that personally, right? But I think it's just very, really easy to, to be allured with the new shiny tool. I, I, I fight this battle all yeah. the time, right? Like with people to say, yeah, that sounds cool. But like, so do the 10 other ideas before that. Let's make sure we come back to the business capability, maturity scale that we built together like last year and see where we still gapped. Because often we could be throwing things that, you know, again, solutions at things that don't mean the most for our customers or not are or truly aren't going to help solve some of our biggest business gaps. So I just wanted to offer that up. No, that's, that's great. Yeah. I think that combines the, no, we're not done, Alan. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> He's trying to ask another question. We're still not it's done. Your, your plan <laughs> moderating. So I, keep going. <laughs> and we appreciate that. Um, so I think, you know, Angela's point combines some of the, the discipline point and the, it depends point, right? You know, there's no clearly right answer in some pieces about whether you build a thing or you buy a thing, but the whole structure needs to make sense and have a, the discipline to say that this whole thing makes sense and we've thought about it and what we're going to deliver with it. And that's not easy. It's hard. Like the shiny thing is hard to resist. But not just that, you know, being able to see more than two or three years down the road or even two or three years down the road is hard. And having the discipline to say, yes, we need to do this thing that we're going to have to do iteratively in a series of we build it or we buy it and we buy this piece and then we buy that piece or whatever it may be, like my ongoing home renovations. Um, that's the sort of thing that, you know, we try to encourage is that longer look horizon and iterative approach to things because no one's going to have perfect information. Yeah. And I, I think the points about, um, choice and, and shiny objects and, you know, that, that whole landscape has changed when you think about, um, over an evolutionary period of time insurance and claims probably had the luxury of looking at de-risk solutions. They were provided by vendors. They may have been tried and true, or it may be a homegrown, um, you know, change that you made over a period of time. Today, there's a lot more experiment, uh, experimental type of solutions in the marketplace. So you spend just as much time uh, going through those and trying to figure out which ones make sense for you. And that's no easy task. So I could spend my whole day watching vendor demos every single day, all day long. I could watch vendor demos. I mean, for, personally, I would find that entertaining, but not necessarily constructive um, as far as constructing like an ecosystem. This is where my Markel claims universe joke comes in. Like I, I want us to think about creating a Markel claims universe now, including Spider-Man, not <laughs> in little bits and pieces, but a whole universe of how we claim. 
I think you're onto something there. And <laughs> that could be a whole nother topic. We'll have to say for another writer's <laughs> we could get into the, um, just the abundance of solutions and not enough time to research them all. But th this question, I think it came from the audience was a really good fit for this because a number of carriers are going through or have gone through recently, um, a, a legacy system type of transformation. At least that's what I think of when I read this. And this was for Hillary. So it says, uh, what will be the impact of integration with a limited number of claims foundational handling systems? So I'm going to assume they're talking about maybe a claims admin system and um, you know how that's going to change things. You have a perspective on that? So I think we've seen the the basic on the PNC side claims like the basic cleansing system, whether that be Guidewire or Duck Creek or whatever it be, like the number of those start to shrink. And I don't know if this is the same, Angela, on the life and health side, but on the PNC side, there are an, an increasingly finite universe of basic foundational cleansing systems. And so then the question becomes, you know, and there are also, despite my joking about I could watch vendor demos all day, an increasingly finite universe of things you can do to tweak that system. You know, they might come in different shades, but this is a basic process automation tool. This is a basic whatever, whatever tool that you can use to tweak that basic system. So then, you know, to me, the question becomes, as that universe becomes more and more defined or perhaps becomes more and more defined, what's left that you differentiate yourself on as a claim service organization? And for me, I really do think it's the people part again, that you know, having the right people, the right segmentation, the right mix of those things is where you will differentiate yourself because that's not to say that we've achieved um, homogeneity. I don't think that's actually true yet, but do I think that could be true in five years for like a big swath of what people need to do to claim? Maybe. Um, and so then the people part becomes even more important and the strategic thinking and segmentation type things become even more important. Peter, Angela, anything to add to that one? So, <clears throat> I guess to just piggyback off of what Hillary was saying, I think, you know, I go back to earlier when we talked about making sure that we're, before we layer on the technology that we have really a vision, right? So to Hillary's point about value proposition, right? Like, you know, we started off many years ago now, probably three or four years ago in the life space, you know, value stream mapping and really understanding the biggest pain points, right? And then we took that and we started to build out kind of a business capability vision, right? Like what, you know, things like, where are we spending the majority of our time? Where do we see bottlenecking? Really looking at it from like a lean practice perspective, right? So going after things like, how do we automate aspects of pay? How do we eventually automate all of pay, right? So that again, you're, 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 it's just full data integration and it's somebody clicking a button, right? So I think, you know, that's at times what gets in the way when, and I do agree, I think it's a niche market. I mean, we were shopping at one point for a claims administrative, you know, system as well. And again, software as a service has made things a lot easier. Cloud-based has made things a lot easier now. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of them differentiate themselves in, you know, I'll call it slivers and slices types of way. And I think it's at times difficult to make decisions that you feel like not just currently is it the best model, but thinking back again to like two, three years from now, right? Is it going to scale? Is it going to do what you need it to do? What other products on the, are on the horizon that eventually will, you know, make the claims experience, you know, require the claims experience to be a bit different. So I think there's just a lot, you know, a lot to consider there, but I, I do agree that in some ways, right, it's a small, but deep, I feel like it's a small, but deep product base that I see out there, whether it's a claims administrative system or it's aspects of claims, things like OCR technology, natural language processing, right? Like I see aspects of that now flavored with data analytics, right? And so you're, you start mm -hmm. off by thinking you want to go down the path of just like digitizing information. So you're going after OCR and then you get out there and it's like, well, is that really just, should we go straight bare bones OCR? Or should we start looking at things that do other things, right? And then it just, 
you know, it's just the RF, RFP process, I feel like just continues <laughs> because there's so much that you can just add on there. And, and there is some segmentation in the market for some of these products that I will say as a consumer, I understand how it came to be that way. I'm just not sure it serves me as a consumer. Like if you asked me to design a basic matter management system, I now have some serious questions as to why you need an SIU matter management system and you need a vendor matter management system and you need a legal matter management system. And I could probably come up with some other shade that I have not been shown matter management system. When most matter managing is a dashboard plus field of data plus a document management system in the background. And I don't personally go see my, my customers don't want five different reports. One, I have to stitch together all those pieces of the universe if I could have a product that managed matters, if that makes sense. Um, and so that may be just me trying to, we have a simplicity kit going on at Markel, trying to simplify things. Um, but I suspect there are other people, other customers thinking that way as well. Oh, thank you. I was just, just going to add real quick. I think the thing that you're both alluding to is really kind of the impact of these niche point solutions, trying to address specific pains. And then obviously where there's platforms that can, you know, when you're thinking about making an investment in a, in a software or solution, if you focus sometimes just on feature functionality, it becomes quite a shallow conversation, I think, in terms of driving certain efficiency gains. But if you really kind of take it back to what you guys are saying, which is in terms of the value that can be generated in terms of can we utilize the same code base across the organization? Is, could it be a tool set that we could then collaborate and share with our business partners, whether in finance or you know, different areas of the business and still use the same platform while then taking all these APIs and integrating all these different maybe point solutions that may still need to exist? I think that becomes kind of the unifying capability and functionality I think that we're all trying to achieve. Um, and I think it's kind of, Having these platform, having these point solutions, or having these things, to make sure that they, you know, you're you're focused on saying, you know, saying what are you really strong and capable in doing versus what would be best suited doing something else, right? So, just thought I'd add that. And as a claims customer, again, I want a universe that claims, right? And so having adaptable products that help me claims across the universe that my partners can understand and that simplify things. That's particularly helpful. So we're again, again sorry we're, to the people oh. who had like four matter management solutions, free, free unsolicited commentary on the matter management solutions, I guess. Yeah. All right, guys, we're down to the last couple of minutes and I wanna just hit you with some lightning rounds. So real fast, uh, let's start with Angela. What are some of the big changes you expect to see in claims in the next five years? And then I'll ask uh, Peter and Hillary to give us their idea as well. Yeah, so I think, you know, Hillary touched on it. Customer portal capability is definitely like not moving fast enough, yet feels like it's moving a thousand miles an hour in some ways, right? So I think that's definitely yet to come. And then I, you know, we've, we spent a lot of time today talking about it. I think the war for talent is real. Um, and I think in some ways we're going to start to see an industry that maybe doesn't at times have a lot of movement. I think we're going to have more movement in a good way. Peter, your outlook. Yeah, I think, you know, I think hope, uh, really great to hear that it resonated in terms of segmentation. I think that's going to become the one of the competitive advantages, those that are able to successfully drive and utilize the segmentation to drive decision making is going to be a kind of the, I think, key differentiator in the next five years in terms of uh, taking decisions. And then when you talk about workforce I think it's really, you know, how can we develop a, a plan that's agile and, and develop that, that can pivot to the changes in our workforce and stay lockstep with our customer needs as well as our business goals um, and still provide the transparency that we need to be able to do our day-to-day -day business. I think that's the two big, big rocks for me. Agile with a small A, I'm sure. That's right. <laughs> Thanks to Hillary. Hillary, your outlook in the next five years. I really think that, and this very much builds on what Peter and Angela have already said, that teaching our industry to be comfortable being uncomfortable 
and adaptable is the biggest thing that we need to do. We've been so same for so long with only minor tweaks that shifting that thinking, whether it's in the people part or in the claims universing part is, is where we need to go. Good point. And I'll echo that. I think um, we're only closer to the starting block than we are the finish line when it comes to innovation and everything that's happening. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for participating. It's been terrific. Peter, Angela, and Hillary, thank you so much for your comments today. And thank you everyone for attending Reuters events and hope to see you again soon. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.